So I'm going to begin a brand new series, one that is very interesting, one that is very relevant to where we're living in right now. I'm going to talk about protection from deception. Interesting subject. We'll be doing three weeks, protection from deception. As we begin, in Acts 20, the Apostle Paul was speaking to church leaders, and he said this, I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Notice that last phrase, the whole counsel of God. Now, when people hear the Word of God, they want to be encouraged and built up. We're living in a world that drains us. We're living in a time of some oppression, some pushback on the things of God. And so we want to be built up. And so I believe the goal of every message is to bring faith, hope, and love. Because these are the three eternal qualities or realities God gives us. People want to be built up and not beat down. But we must be open to the entire Bible, not just the feel-good scriptures. Now, I love the feel-good scriptures. We need those. But we need all of God's Word. Paul said, I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God. So I've determined early in my ministry, if it's in the scriptures, especially over and over, we need to look at it. We need to examine it. I'm going to preach the whole counsel, or at least... All the counsel that I understand. How many of you know, no one has a full revelation of the whole counsel of God? But as much as I see in Scripture, I'm going to minister that to you. We need that in our lives. I am determined to preach from Genesis to Revelation, from the index in the front to the maps in the back. If it is in the Scriptures, we need to read it, understand it, walk in it, as a reality. Now, I was praying about this this week, and the Lord reminded me there are three main purposes when we teach about things about end times. The first thing is this, it should produce faith, not fear. Understand that. How many of you know that with COVID, there was a lot of fear? But the Word of God says, faith comes by hearing. So when you hear end times, it should not cause you to be afraid. It should produce faith, not fear. Secondly, to give you a revelation of who Jesus really is. If we really understood him in his fullness, people would be running to him. And then lastly, to prepare ourselves to be ready for his coming. How many of you know Jesus is coming again? And we're to be ready for that coming. We're to be prepared for that. The Bible was not given to scare us. It was given to prepare us. Now, 2 John 4 says this. I was greatly delighted to find some of your children walking or living in the truth, just as we have been commanded by the Father himself. Notice this. I was greatly delighted to find some of your children walking or living in the truth. So the opposite of deceit is truth. Truth is found in the Word of God. Now, walking in the truth is not automatic. Notice the word some above. I have been greatly delighted to find some of your children Not every believer is walking in the truth, but yet we are commanded by the Father God to do so. I want to look at a very fascinating verse and a passage, and I'm going to ask you to look at your Bibles if you would, access it on your phones. Go to Matthew chapter number 24. This is the last thing Jesus ministered on prior to his crucifixion, well-known passage. We call this the Olivet Discourse because he shared this from the Mount of Olives. And it says this, verse 1, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Now the temple was magnificent. It was gorgeous. So they were showing off the temple to Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, Not one stone 
shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. So he's talking about the destruction of the temple. Now let me give you some background. The temple occupied an area of about 19 acres. To give you an idea of the size of that, Berean with all of our grounds is eight and a half acres. Well, if you double that and have a couple of more acres, that was the size of the temple. It was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And listen to this, it took the Jews 46 years to renovate and extend the temple. So it took them almost 50 years to build this. And Jesus said, the day is coming when not one stone is going to be left upon another. It's going to be pulled down. So, verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so they hear this this declaration from Jesus, and they wait until they get with him privately and say, okay, explain what you mean by that. And they asked him three questions. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? I just want to remind you, Jesus is not talking about the church in this passage. He's talking to the Jews. He's talking about different things from Daniel's prophecies concerning the Jewish people, Judea, and the Sabbath. This passage is not a reference to the rapture. It primarily deals with what we call the seven-year tribulation period, and really the Jews are going to have a big part in that. And So let's look at these three questions because they deserve looking at. Number one, when will these things be? What things? They were saying concerning the temple... When will not one stone be left upon another? This actual answer is found in the Gospel of Luke, not in Matthew. But this was fulfilled some 40 years later when Titus and the Roman legions destroyed the city of Jerusalem and tore down the temple. So that was in A.D. 70. That prophetic word came to pass. How bad was it? The Jewish historian Josephus claimed that over a million people were killed by the Romans and over 100,000 were taken captive. But here's the thing. I was reading about this yesterday. The Romans surrounded Jerusalem and were about ready to take the city, but then there was a change in leadership with the emperor. So they had to leave for a season and go away. The Jews that remembered this word fled and were preserved. The ones that did not stayed. The Romans came back, they destroyed the temple, and not one stone was left upon another. It pays to listen to the prophetic word of God. Now secondly, what will be the sign of your coming? This is answered in Matthew 24, verses 29 through 44. This refers to the coming of Christ, not the rapture. It takes place after the tribulation, and that's what the Jews understood and anticipated. And then the question we see at number three is, what will be the sign of the end of the age? That is still a very valid question. Now, older translations say, what will be the sign of the end of the world? But listen to me, there will not be an end of the world but there will be an end of the age called the tribulation and also the age of grace that we live in. The earth will continue forever, but this age will end at the second coming of Christ. Now again, though Matthew 24 deals with the tribulation period, how many of you know we are seeing seeds of these things in the earth right now? We're seeing an increase of many of these signs that Jesus prophesied. Now, recognize this. The closer we get to his coming, the more they will increase in frequency and intensity. The word Jesus used 
with sorrows. These are the beginning of sorrows. The Greek says birth pangs. When a woman gives birth, all of a sudden things begin to happen in her body, but the closer she gets to giving birth, all of those signs increase with frequency and intensity. I remember that. I was there three different times. I remember, I believe it was when Victoria was born, uh, I was in the front encouraging Pastor Stephanie, come on, breathe, he, he, ho. Remember, he, he, ho, you can do it, you can do it. And then the doctor said, come on back and see the baby as it's coming back and coming out. And I went to the back and began to see all of that, and I began to faint. And I remember my knees were buckling and I was going down and Pastor Stephanie said, don't you faint, you get up. And I jerked out of that and I was okay. And I came back to the front end and I did my part. You have to say, I did my part, I did not faint. But literally I was going down and I heard that yell and I got back up. So, But I understand birth pangs, been there, done that. I was on the better end of the deal, but nonetheless I was there. How many of you would agree we're seeing birth pangs in the earth? They're increasing in frequency and in intensity. There are things we're seeing in America that 10 years ago, I said, there's no way in my lifetime we will see these things, and we're doing that on a regular basis. All that means is Jesus is coming soon. Now, Rick Renner says there are 18 different signs Jesus gave. I'm going to list 10 of these. Tell me if we see these in the earth. False Christs and false messiahs. Wars, Ukraine. Rumors of war. Conflict among the nations. Famines. What about this? Pestilences and epidemics. COVID. Earthquakes. Persecution and martyrdom. False prophets and false religions an increase of sin and spiritual apathy, and the worldwide preaching of the gospel. I believe we're seeing an increase of all of these things, but what is interesting, the one thing that came through COVID was Facebook and Zoom and live presentations. Every single week we sit in our offices, Pastor Stephanie and I, and we're preaching the gospel around the world. We don't need a visa, we don't need a ticket, we don't need to travel, and the gospel is going forth freely around the world. Thank God for what God is doing in that area. But deception is the most frequent sign mentioned in this chapter. It is mentioned more than earthquakes, wars, famines, etc. Many other signs are spoken of, but Jesus mentioned deception both first and most often. I'll say that again. Jesus mentioned deception both first and most often. I don't believe that's a coincidence. I believe that's important. We need to understand what Jesus said. Verse 4, and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one, we don't have to talk to me now, deceives you, leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. So the first sign is this, take heed that no one deceives you. Another translation says, at that time, deception will run rampant. I believe we're living in that time right now. Jesus prophesied that. The word deceives mean to believe what is false to be true, to be misled, to be ensnared. I like this translation, to roam from safety or truth. What is truth? Truth is found in the Word of God. Have we as a nation roamed from truth? We can see that at this time. And then Rick Renner's uh, definition from the Greek, to wander off course. Have we seen that in the West and in the nations? Wandering off the course God has given to us. Deception is real, and it cannot be ignored. But listen to me, neither should it be feared. Understand that. Believers can be deceived. 
but they won't be if they do what Jesus told us to do. Remember this, take heed that no one deceives you. And in this passage, the one word that we find quite often is many. It says, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. I have good news for you. Many is not all. I choose not to be part of the many. I choose to be one of those that say, I will stand with God and I will stand on truth. So, let's continue with what Jesus said. And I will mention this. I love this quote. Too many Christians have more faith in the devil's ability to deceive than in God's ability to lead. I'll say that again. Too many Christians have more faith in the devil's ability to deceive us than in God's ability to lead us. Now, let me also say this. I love the body of Christ. I love the different flavors. In the same way that Baskins and Robbins had, what, 31 flavors, there wasn't a right or wrong. There are different flavors in the body of Christ. And I love, you know, those who know Jesus Christ who are denominational or Catholic or Pentecostal or evangelical. I love the church, and there's a lot of diversity. When I talk about deception, I see some people on YouTube that anyone that's preaching different than they are deceived. Any charismatic leader you like, they're deceived. I'm not talking about that. Thank God there can be some differences, but we all love Jesus Christ. We're born again, and we're working together for the sake of the gospel. We're not talking about that. Now, Satan is the master deceiver, but we are not ignorant of his devices. Let's look at the second passage in Matthew 24 about deception. Verse 9 then they will deliver you to tribulation and kill you. This is really speaking about the Jewish people in the tribulation. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. We're seeing a greater persecution against Israel once again. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Do we live in an offended age right now? Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Again, the word deceive is mentioned, and deceive many. And then notice this, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. That word lawlessness is interesting. Several years ago, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, Bob Yandian did a series on lawlessness. And I remember the cover was, was police in riot gear, and I thought, that, that's not relevant to where we're living. And how many of you know things have changed in the last 20 years? And we're seeing an increase in lawlessness. And I define that as simply this. People only follow the laws they agree with. And if they don't agree with it, they don't do it. We're seeing lawlessness increase. But again, I love verse number 14. In the midst of all of that, what do we do? Do we hide? Do we pull away from society? Do we run scared? No, we continue to preach the gospel of Jesus around the world until he returns. Because verse 14, after all of these signs, says this, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Our job is not to be in fear, not to pull back, not to retreat, but to continue to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. The only answer to the world's ills, ultimately, is Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. So, verse 5 and 11 talk about false Christ, false prophets deceiving many, but aren't you glad that many is not all? One translation says, see to it that no one misleads you. So that's a choice that we can make. And then the third example of deception in this chapter is verses 23 and 24. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. 
So the elect would refer to believers. But the good news is we don't have to be deceived. We don't have to be misled. We have the truth, we have the Holy Spirit, and we have our brothers and sisters to hold us accountable. But it's interesting because the word deceive or deceives is found four times in the first 24 verses. Four times. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. We've had Pastor Billy Burke here probably at least 50 times over the years doing meetings, and uh, awesome meetings, tremendous meetings. But when you have an evangelist, you have the good, the bad, and the ugly coming out to, to the meetings. And so a lot of times we got workers that came in to help from all over. They were blessed by the meetings, wonderful people, godly people. But one day there was a very attractive woman, probably in her 50s, and she set up an appointment to meet with me. And she was coming to a lot of the meetings, and she was involved in them very actively, or wanted to be anyway. She wanted to get involved. And she said, I want to talk to you. And she sat down and talked to me, and she said, I was trained under a healer in South Africa. Now, we don't use that phrase healer because you understand you're not a healer. I'm not a healer. Billy Burke is not a healer. There's only one healer, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the only healer. But she said, I, she said, I sat under a healer, and I was trained, and now I want to sit under Billy Burke as a healer. And so that kind of gave me a red flag. And then she said this, the person that she sat under would place his hands upon the sick. And when he removed his hand, there was an unseen hand underneath the skin that would move around and bring healing to the body. Now, my, the hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I began to realize that's not Jesus Christ. That's a fake. That's a false reality. That's, that's a counterfeit. And she said, so he would put his hand on a body, and he would lay hands upon it, and when he pulled his hands away, there'd be an unseen hand underneath ministering to that person. How many of you know there's never a record of that in the Scripture? And so I said, what's the name of your healer? And she gave it to me, and I wrote it down. And as I did some research, he had a website with a hodgepodge of healers on the website, Jesus Christ being only one of many. How many of you know that's a, a deception? Now, that should not frighten us. How many of you recognize right now that as you spend your cash, there are counterfeit bills out there? You don't have to be afraid of it, but then the reality is there are some counterfeits. Does that keep you from spending money? Does that keep you from buying things? You just recognize there's a counterfeit, there's a real. Anything God does, the devil tries to counterfeit. We have the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have a counterfeit, Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet. We have the gifts of the Spirit. The devil tries to counterfeit those. That doesn't scare us, but that does make us recognize we need to be cautious and wise in those areas. And so that woman minister, or talked to me, and we began to talk about things. I began to share some things, and I told the ministry team with Billy Burke, she's, she has a hunger for things, but she's not walking with the Lord. That's a counterfeit. You don't want to use her. You need to be born again. You, there's only one way to receive healing, and that is through the healer himself, Jesus Christ. And so we don't need to be frightened, but we do need to be wise. I look at things in our, in our world right now and thought of a couple of things. One, because we no longer follow biblical values, we see nations pulling away from their support of Israel. How many of you know Israel are still God's people today? And we need to bless them because the promise is still true. God will bless those that bless Israel, and he will curse those that curse Israel. But we see a pulling away from supporting Israel. Things that were once tolerated, I'm sorry, recognized as sin, are both tolerated and celebrated now. Would you agree with that? We can see these things being pushed upon our children as well. We now call good evil and evil good. Many cannot define what a woman is. People are confused about their gender and their identity. Many feel that Jesus is only one of many ways 
to God. My friend, if we're going to walk in truth in these last days, it can't be your truth or my truth. There was only one truth. Jesus is the truth. The Word of God is the truth. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. There's a verse in Romans that says this, professing to be wise, they became fools. And we see that with with much of our thinking. I look at things and say, how can you begin to think that or believe that or, or to embrace that? But when you get away from truth, you can easily be led astray. But aren't you glad we have the spirit of truth on the inside of us? We have the word of truth right here, and we have Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I know this is not the kind of sermon that makes you want to run and jump, but how many of you know we need all of God's counsel? If Jesus took the time to teach this and emphasize deception, three different passages, we need to recognize that, understand it, and walk in the wisdom of God. I want to close with one more example that would illustrate this. I won't give his name, but there is a well-known preacher that maybe 10 years ago or so, he was a graduate of of Oral Roberts University. He pastored, which is a great university. We've got Oral Roberts graduates here. He pastored a large, multiracial, charismatic church in in Tulsa. He used to hold huge Christian conferences every year with up to 10,000 people. He was an award-winning singer. He was well-known. He ministered with Catherine Kuhlman many years ago, Oral Roberts, and many others. But eventually, he he began to change his theology. I'm not talking about something minor. We can have minor differences, but this was major. After much success, he had a major change in his theology. He departed from Scripture and began following the writings of certain early church writers. He began embracing what is called the gospel of inclusion or universalism. And that's been around for a long time. It rises up every now and again. It's becoming more popular again. But how many of you know the enemy every now and again has certain things resurface? They give it a different title, but it's the same basic thinking. And I was reading after him on his website, and he said this, the whole world is already saved. Can I tell you? That's not true. The whole world is already saved, whether they know it or not, not just professing Christians in good standing, but Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, atheists, gay people. There is no hell after you die. Now, I would like to believe that, But I have to believe what Jesus said. He said, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus said more about hell than he did about heaven. He said, there's a hell to shun, a heaven to gain. Many, many verses talk about that. But uh, this man got the revelation, there is no hell after you die. Now, you can't give scripture for that, but what's interesting If you have a preacher who preaches the gospel, Netflix doesn't want to hear you. But Netflix gave this man a documentary because they like that idea, there is no hell. Let's do a movie on him. But he departed from the truth of Scripture. Now, why did he do that? Well, he began to study some of the early church fathers who had a thinking towards that end. But again, our foundation has to be What does the Bible say? What does Jesus say in that area? And then I read this statement. He said this, Our mission is to help create and inspire comprehensive global planetary and cosmic peace on every level of human experience and expression. Our purpose is to help create and provide people with technique techniques and emotional technologies to both discover and recover their divine selves, bridging our humanity to our divinity. I'm not quite sure what that is all about, but you can see a confusion as his thinking began to change. Now, what's interesting, he had a church of about 3,000 in Tulsa, great church, some very famous worship leaders, but as he began to make the shift, 
I know of several, two in particular, that talked with him about that. One was Oral Roberts. Oral, I believe, wrote him a letter about that and began to, to show him how he was in error. How many of you know if Oral Roberts writes you a letter personally correcting some things, it's good to heed that wisdom? And then Bob Yandian, who was my pastor for many years, sat down and went over verse after verse to show him how his thinking was wrong. Several others came to him, but he would not be moved. He believed what he believed, and that's what he was going with. And so he basically denied uh, the, the foundations of the Christian faith, and I have heard that he is now an atheist. And that's what happens when you begin to veer off. If you veer off just a little bit but continue, you can get very, very off. Listen to me. Every one of us has blind spots. Every one of us. Remember when David was, had committed adultery with Bathsheba, he was called on the carpet by Nathan, and Nathan gave him a parable about someone that stole a lamb, even though he had all of these other things. And David said, the man that has done this will pay fourfold. And Nathan said, David, you are the man. And his eyes were opened, and he realized what he had done, and he repented before the Lord. Can I be honest with you? We need each other. We need people to speak into our lives. If you say, I could never be deceived, you may be deceived already. We're all able to miss the mark. That's why we need to say, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm going to be teachable. I love this phrase. I give it often. No one is unreachable as long as they are teachable. I'm going to say that one again. That's worth the price of admission right there. No one is unreachable as long as they are teachable. Now, I don't like control at all. In fact, I hate controlling churches and controlling people. We don't control people because God doesn't control you. But I want people that can speak into my life. And I've got some mothers and grandmothers that will call me on the carpet if they need to. And I'm okay with that because I want to stay humble before the Lord because I never want to get off course. Now, some of this sounds negative, which it's not, but it's a warning that Jesus gave because he saw deception as an end-time reality. We're living in those days. But I'm going to end with this. That's not the end of the story. Isaiah 60 says this. This is what I want to end with. God prophesies and he says this. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and His glory will be seen upon you. And the nations will come to your light. Notice the comparison between light and darkness. Believers who walk with the Lord are called light. We walk in the light. Unbelievers can often walk in darkness. Listen to this. Both the darkness and the light are intensifying at the same time. People says, say, Pastor Mark, the darkness is getting so much darker. Yes, it is but I believe the light is getting so much brighter. And the light will always be stronger than the darkness. No matter how dark things get, once that light comes on, you can see clearly. I remember asking Joe Morris, who lives in Tulsa, about this particular man that got off doctrinally. And I said, how did that happen? And he said this. He said, Oral Roberts was known for healing. Kenneth Hagin was known for faith. And if you know anything about Tulsa, those are the two main ministries, Rama and ORU. And he said, this man wanted to be known for something. Well, he's now known for something, but it's not a good thing. Listen, you need to be satisfied in your lane. Don't push for something that is not supposed to be yours. I choose 
God's best in my life. And I believe in this hour, though the darkness is getting darker, the light is shining bright. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is rising upon the church. The darkness never overcomes the light. The light always overcomes the darkness. Will there be deception? Yes, there will. Will there be darkness? Yes, there will. I'm not afraid of it. I have the spirit of truth on the inside and the word of truth right here. We are going to walk in the light and we're going to be a blessing to the nation. Let's arise in this hour, not hiding in fear, but stepping forth to say, I will be the light. I will be bold for Jesus Christ, and I will walk in truth. Let's stand together.